Well, let's go ahead and pray, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for, tonight, for today. We thank you, Father, for your will and your, your moving of your spirit, for what you've done so far. God, we thank you for what you're about to do in the word. We pray right now that you give us ears to hear. You give us hearts to receive and hearts to respond, God. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would literally begin to move our heart, Lord God, with the things that move your heart. Lord, we got, begin to prick us with the, 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 the very things that would be, begin to hold us back from you, Lord God, begin to move us into that place where deeper hunger comes upon us, comes upon us, and deep cries out unto deep in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we have been talking about Holy Spirit. We're going to continue to talk about Holy Spirit today, just for a, just for uh, um, a little while here. And um, last week, the Lord really began to move upon us for what He wanted to do as far as how He wants to have a relationship with us, and He wants to have that, but. We've been talking about how Holy Spirit is holy. He's a third person of the Godhead. He is a person. Right? He's not an it. He's not a thing. He's a person. And we have to understand if he's a person, then he has a personality. And because he is a person, we understand that he was given to us for us to have relationship with. And he wants to have this relationship with us. But what we have to understand is that, number one, he's holy. So he's not common, he's holy. And because he's holy, we have to realize that means that you have received something inside of you that is so holy, that is so sacred, that literally the Godhead, one of the Godhead literally now lives within us. We've been sealed by his spirit for the day of redemption, but we have been baptized into his spirit for the love and relationship that we can have with him. So when we understand this, then we begin to step into a reality of, of, of understanding that literally my life is not my own. Look at your neighbor and say, your life is not your own. See, so you, so you can say, well, I can go do what I want. Well, sure you could, but you're not going to have any reward to that. I can go do where I want. Well, sure you could, but you're not living up to what the Lord has for you. I mean, why would you want to live secondary when you can live first class, Right. Why would you want to live underneath of what God has for you when, you when God has it all for us right here? And so all we have to do is begin to understand that he's got something for us. But in the relationship, we grow in him. And we begin to realize, okay, he's a holy God. So I'm not going to expose God to certain things. That makes sense? Okay, guys will understand this. Guys, we've been around. I mean, we know what it's like to be men. We've been around men who are, say, not so kosher for women to be around, right? Some of you women are like, well, I, I've been around those guys. I know, but let's go with me here on this. So what happens is, is that in those times when those things are happening, I'm not going to bring my wife and my daughter around those kinds of men. I can handle those things. I can handle those men. It doesn't bother me. But I'm not going to bring my family around that. Well, why? Because I don't want them exposed to that kind of stuff. Certain men have certain agendas. No, my family can't come around, especially my wife and my daughter. You can't come around my wife and my daughter, right? You all know what I'm saying? I'm not saying they don't need redeemed. I'll do that, but without her, right? That's just, okay. Well, in the same way, I'm not going to take Holy Spirit and expose him to something that is not good because he's so holy, he's so sacred. I don't want to expose him to something that literally begins to grieve him. Does that make sense? Amen. Go ahead. All right. So um, this morning, let's start in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. And we're talking about fellowship and communion with the Holy Spirit. And that verse says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now, communion, lots of you may already know this, is the word koinonia. And it means communion, partnership, and participation. So the, what the Lord really wants to get across to us this morning is just all about this fellowship and this, this partnership that we are truly to have with him. Communion means the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially if the change is on a spiritual or mental level. 
So communion is the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially if the exchange is on a spiritual or mental level. So in order for me to get to know Holy Spirit intimately, for him to, for me to know his intimate thoughts and for him to know my intimate thoughts, it takes more than just being in here and experiencing him here. Because sometimes it's hard in a room full of people to have that, that intimate encounter where I can pour out what's in my heart of hearts. So it takes that, that fellowship and that communion with him in the secret place where I can just fully be completely open and I can pour out on him and then just take time and listen in that quiet place where I can hear his intimate thoughts, his, the things that he has to tell me. Another word I looked up there was partnership, which is the state of being a partner or partners. And the synonyms are cooperation, collaboration, union, alliance, relationship, fellowship, connection. Are you getting the gist of this? It is, it is me and Holy Spirit, and we are connected. And and. We work in a, you know, you work in partnership with Holy Spirit, but without the fellowship with him, without knowing him, without talking to him, without spending time in the presence of Holy Spirit, there can't be that connection. Just like in a marriage, Dean and I can't really be partners if we don't ever talk, if we don't ever communicate with one another. I'm not going to know what he's doing, and he's not going to know what I'm doing, and we're going to be off on our separate ways, not having that. We're not going to be in union with one another. We're not going to have that um, that connection where we can function as one, because that's how God created us to be, right? A man and a wife were created to be one, but without communion, without fellowship, without communication. There's no way that we can function as one. And that's what Holy Spirit desires for us, is for us to, to, to have that kind of connection with him where we're functioning as one with him. Turn with me to, um, to John, chapter 14, verses uh, 16 through 18. It says there, and I will pray the, pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Another there means another as the same sort. So it's, this, it's Jesus in spirit, because we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So it's Jesus coming, his spirit coming in us to dwell in us. And that's what starts the partnership. When we receive salvation, the Holy Spirit comes and he dwells in us, right? And then we take it a step further and we get baptized in the Holy Spirit where, where we're, we're immersed in that power, in that boldness, Right? And that starts our relationship with him. It do, that's not the ending place of the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit. That's the starting place. That's where we start. And then as we come in and just really let ourselves get to that intimate place with him, that's where we start acting as one with him because we know his heart. We know what he desires because he's told us in that sacred place. And if you flip back to John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, it says, On that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. 
He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And I looked up the word thirst here, and it says those who are said to thirst painfully feel the want of and eagerly long for those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, and strengthened. Those who thirst painfully feel the want and eagerly long for those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported, and strengthened. We should be burning with the desire to know Holy Spirit. It sh we should feel it. Like that's a physical thing. That's not just spiritual. That's a physical thing. I feel the need. I feel the desire. I feel the passion for Holy Spirit. We should have that. And sometimes it just doesn't come instantaneously. But as, you're, as you set forth your mind to say, I want this relationship with the Holy Spirit, that desire and that passion, it grows and it ignites. And then you're so full of it, you cannot stop yourself from coming into his presence. You cannot stop yourself when you come in here to, to be one with him and say, Holy Spirit, what is it that you have me to do today? What is my part today? Because we're all here and we all play a part. But unless you have that communion with him, you're not going to know what your part is. Right. You have to talk to him. You have to let him talk to you. You have to get to know one another. And as you do that, you can't help it. You cannot help it. Because it just, it's like fire shut up in your bones. And, you know, you see people and they're running around the sanctuary and you're like, what are all these people, what are they doing? It's that fire. It's that thirst. It's that hunger. To be like him, to be used by him, to get to know him more. And it's powerful. And it'll make you do things that you never thought you would ever do. And that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. It'll stretch you way far out of where you ever thought you would be. And that's, but that's okay because that's his desire. Because in us, in ourselves, we can't do it. We can't do it. It yeah. takes him. Amen. First Thessalonians says something that's very interesting. It's, it talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. And we want to be very aware. How many of y'all know it's very important in these days that we understand that we are to literally take careful heed to what we are listening to? So to grieve Holy Spirit um, literally means to, that you begin to cause him harm. And I want to tell you something. Here's the thing that we're running into. We, we run into we're running into it in church world. Is that most people would, when they come to church, they'll sit, they'll, they'll endure the worship a little bit. But when the, when the speaking or preaching begins or teaching begins, they check out and go to Facebook or start texting. And that's one of the things that's happening. It's happening here. It's happening everywhere. I mean, you, it happens everywhere. See, when that begins to happen, that tells you that you're not hungry for Holy Spirit. That tells me I'm not hungry for Holy Spirit. When I'm hungry for Holy Spirit, I'm going to come in and anticipate, wait for the message. And there have been messages I've heard that have been the most basic of messages that I've heard time and time again. But yet when I listened, there was something that hit me. And I was like, that's it. That was the thing I was missing. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Um, when you play basketball, you know, when they would line up for the, fr the, the free throws, there was a guy by the name of Russ Clark, right? Russ Clark. And he would sit there with you, and you'd stand there at the, at the foul line, and you'd stand there, and he'd say, okay, you're going to bend your knees, lift the ball up over your head, up on your toes, and shoot off the fingertips. And if anything was out of order, you wouldn't make it right. It would look, it would, you would give an air ball. But he would always say, you know, same thing, same stance, same way. Why? Because you got to get the foundations. If you don't have the foundations, you're not going to be able to move forward. And if you're not hungry to inspect the foundations, it's very interesting when they fly planes, they go through everything each time to make sure that each thing is checked, each thing is working correctly, each thing is, is, is measured out right, so that what happens is when they take off, they're not going to crash that plane. When the same way, folks, when we come in here, we should really be in a place where we're hungry and we're saying, okay, I'm ready for what you have. 
I, and, and don't look at the speakers or the preachers or the, the, the pastoral staff as pastoral staff. We have to say, okay, they're oracles of God, and they're going to speak on his behalf. We didn't, we, we didn't take time. We didn't get the stuff offline. You know, right? We, we didn't go to pastors.com, get our message downloaded, put it here. Okay? We didn't do that. We spent time in the presence of God saying, okay, Lord, what is it you want? And this is not a rebuke. I'm saying this is an error that we are having right now in today's society. You know why? Because it's so tempting to get on here. We say, well, we're multitasking. Let's be careful of that. Because I wouldn't multitask in the, in, in the presence of God. You won't multitask at the throne. <laughs> I'm not rebuking anybody. I'm just saying, we, we won't. We won't. We'll be like, I mean, it'll be full attention to him. Everything about us will be given directly to him. There'll be, there'll be no, no second guessing, no questioning, no, no, well, I wonder what so-and-so is doing. I wonder what's on Facebook. I wonder what's on Instagram. Hey, have you seen this video on YouTube? None of that. Oh, somebody text me. It won't be like that. And so when we are here, we need to realize the culture that we want here is one that does not grieve the spirit. And I understand that the worship goes longer than some can, some can stand. I get that. And some may sit down. I totally understand that. But when we sit down, again, this is not rebuke. This is just saying, let's check our hearts in this. When, when, when we sit down, are we checking out or are we still engaging? That's the question. We had, a, we had a precious woman here, and uh, she now has moved to Marietta, and she is unable to drive, so she can't come here right now. But we had a precious saint of God who was here, and she couldn't stand for very long, so she would sit. And she would tell me things like, now, I'm going to sit. I'm 86 years old. I'm going to sit, but that does not mean I'm actually sitting. See, that's the heart. I may be sitting but inside, I'm still worshiping God. Inside, I'm still going after the Lord. See, so that's what we want to do. We're engaging and we want to be ready for what God has because we don't want to grieve. To grieve literally means to cause pain to, to cause hurt, and it means to make to feel unwanted. When we grieve him, we make him feel unwanted. That is not what we want to do here. That is not what we want to have here. We want Jesus. We want the Lord. Listen, everything that the world's throwing at us is a bunch of hogwash. Everything that the world's throwing at us is a bunch of hogwash. And folks, we need Jesus. This, this nation needs Jesus. And so we have to be ready for what God wants to do. So Becky's going to talk about it here in a minute. But we don't want to grieve him. We want to embrace him. And we want to come in hungry. Now, here's a, here's a real quick way you could do this. And, and Paul would write to Timothy, and he would say, stir up the gifts that are, that, are, that are within you by the laying on of my hands. And he would say, stir up the gifts. How, how do we stir up the gifts? This is real simple. I'm a practical guy, right? And I do this from time to time. When I begin to feel like I'm beginning to get dry, I'll fast, I'll get in the Word, I'll pray, and I'll do this. And put your hands right here on your belly and say, in the name of Jesus... I stir up the gifts within me. In the name of Jesus, I ask for the holy fire of God. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, turn me up. Turn me up. Make me hungry for you that I may know you more. In Jesus' name. And then I continually move on with the Lord. And I stay in a place. See, he wants to know you. He wa He's a real person. Holy Spirit, he wants you to know him. And he wants to know you. Now, you may say, well, he, he already knows me. Let's talk about this, okay? Because Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Well, what was prophecy? Prophecy is a gift, Right? Right? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Well, what's that talk about? Authority. Didn't we do mighty signs and wonders in your name? All these things. But yet Jesus still says, depart from me. You who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. How can that be that he never knew us, but we were still able to prophesy, still able to do all this? Because the gifts are without repentance. You can have the gifts and still not know Holy Spirit. You may say, well, how do I know Holy Spirit then? 
That's where it's a personal relationship with you and him. Just as Becky's talking about, there's that thing inside of you that says, I just want him. Like that thirst, how does that say that painfully, to painfully yearn for, or however it says there for thirst, that we thirst for him. Yes, that we want him so much that we are continually pursuing him. And not to say that we've attained everything. No, but we press on, just as Paul would say. We press on to say, I want him all the more. Because when I press on like that, I'm saying, I want everything that Jesus has for me. I want to know you, Holy Spirit. I don't want to just come in and check out. I don't want to say church is just, oh, I'm just not going to attend church. See, the minute you begin to get calloused to services, the minute you begin to get calloused to the moving of the Spirit, the minute you begin to get calloused to what God wants to do in you is the minute that you begin to put out your fire. So we have to be so careful that we don't become calloused because to become calloused means I literally have now treated the holy things of God as commonplace. When I treat the holy things of God as commonplace, I've now become calloused. And so I'm no longer moved when the little ones begin to prophesy. I'm no longer moved when, when our teenagers are crying out how much they love Jesus. I'm no longer moved when, when, when families come and are reconciled. I'm no longer moved when someone gives their life to the Lord. I'm no longer moved. I just expect it. But we have to realize, uh, I'm not trying to bounce off of Caleb, but Caleb talked to me about this before he gave it. This doesn't happen everywhere. We're not the only one, but this doesn't happen everywhere. And, and we want to understand this is such a, a very sacred thing that we want to honor what God is doing. We want to honor Holy Spirit because I'm not going to touch it. I, I mean, I'm just going to try to steer the ship a little bit, but he's in charge. So... We just want to honor what Holy Spirit is doing and how he's moving in amongst us and how he's, he's continuing to just show his goodness to us. And we're, see, we, we need to praise God when someone like Christina begins to sing that powerful song. That was awesome. See, those kinds of things that move us and we see people growing in their gifts and we see people discovering their gifts and we see people hungering for what is my gift and what is my calling. That's all great. But when we get to know him, then we get everything we need. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Share with that, James. That James. James 4, 5, and this is from the Passion Translation. It says, does the scripture mean nothing to you that says, the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us. He's not satisfied with anything less He's not satisfied with anything less than all of us. He jealously longs for that relationship with you. He doesn't want anything above him. He's the one that should capture our attention and our hearts. And John, it says... When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he does not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. That's his desire. Yeah. And he jealously longs for it. Just like Adam said earlier, somebody hits on his wife, you, you better watch out. Do you understand that's how the Lord is with us? That's how the Holy Spirit is with us. Anything that gets in the way of him, he wants to shut it down. He wants yeah. to shut it down. He wants to be the one that captivates us, that, that, that enthralls our hearts because he is enthralled with us. Yeah. He loves us that much and he desires us that much. And it's in it. It's in him for us to desire him that much. To drink means to receive into the soul what serves to refresh, strengthen, and nourish it unto life eternal. So when we drink him in, it's awesome. Yeah. It is awesome to bring that nourishment to us. And there is nothing that the enemy would like more 
than to keep that from happening. So he will tell you, you ain't got time for this. You, it's not that important. The Lord of the universe has better things to do, right? No, no. It's his desire for us Amen. and should be our desire for him. Amen. He made, it, he made a promise in the scripture that he who began the good work in us will complete it until the day of Christ, right? He will complete it. So that's why he wants us to hunger after him because it's a two-way street. As we hunger after him, James would say, if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So as we hunger after him and we draw near to him, then what happens is, as we're drawing near, the good works that Christ has called us to will be completed in us, and the redemption, the full redemption package that God has made through His Son's blood for us to have, that we would be able to be completely redeemed, made whole all over again, that the wages of sin would no longer be able to tear it or to be able to take its toll on us, but that we would be able to stand in a place of redemption, being fully able to stand before the Father with a clean conscience. I want you to remember this. Please remember this. I heard this the other day. Thank God for Derek Prince. Thank God. Derek Prince has went on to be with the Lord. That man was such a general in the Lord. What a mighty man of God. He has such a strong teaching. And he made this comment. I've never heard this before. I've always, I've been on this thing of looking at it. But then he made this comment. I was like, wow, that's it. He said, guilt is the enemy's victory. Righteousness is God's victory. When the enemy can keep you in a place where you still feel guilty of something, he has victory over you. Right? How many of y'all would uh, get in a boat in, say, I don't know, let's just say the Nile River in Uganda? Talk to Pastor Henry a little bit. The Nile River in Uganda. And you're in this boat, right? It's not a big boat. It's a little boat. Okay? And you've got a hole the size of your thumb. Just that big. How many of y'all would get in a boat like that? Why? What's going to happen? That boat's going to sink, right? Well, see, that's what the enemy tries to do with that guilt. It may only be the size of a hole. The, 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 soul may, the hole may be only the size of my thumb. But that, that hole will cause you to sink. Guilt gives the enemy victory. But righteousness gives us victory. So when we come into this relationship with him, we then begin to come into a place where, again, we draw near and we are exposing everything of ourselves that he already knows about, but we're exposing all those hurts and all those things that you may say, well, well how do I handle it? We ask him. We've been in, rela in, in relationship for now 19 years, going on 19 years. And so there are certain times where we'll come into a situation and, it will be, and I'll just say, it, man, I don't know for sure where I'm going with this. And she'll say the same to me. And so we help each other out. Well, see, we're in covenant relationship with Holy Spirit. And when we say, Holy Spirit, I don't know where I'm going with this. I, I, I got this, but I don't know how to get rid of it. I know I'm supposed to give it to you, but I don't know how. See, that's the honesty that is needed to be able to bring us into that place where we come in and begin to experience his freedom. That's why she would talk about how that the Lord, he, he yearns for us. He's like a jealous lover. So he wants to get those things out of us. Anything that would hold us back, anything that caused us guilt, we want to go ahead and get rid of. Because we don't want any way for the enemy to come in. There was a man who was a powerful, just a mighty man of God, preacher. And he had done a lot of things for the Lord, went overseas, done a lot of things, was in a lot of terrible places. But he had this one thing that he couldn't let go of. And this man would did a lot of things for the Lord and really loved the Lord, ministered to thousands of people. Um, but here at the end of his life, he now has dementia. And one of the things about it was he always said, he said, I wish I could forget what the enemy's done to me. I wish I could forget what the sins I'd done. And now he has dementia, working into Alzheimer's. You see how we need to let those things go and go under the blood? Those things, no matter how bad the pain was, those things have to go under the blood because we don't want anything to hold us back from our relationship. Because, see, those things that maybe be the size of a hole, the size of my thumb, 
those things actually cause a distraction and will begin to cause us to go elsewhere and begin to fulfill our lives with other things rather than him. And that's where the, that's where the, the, the literally, that's where the, the, um, um, the deception comes in at because that deception causes you and I to go elsewhere to find fulfillment because we can't feel, we don't feel we can stand before him in truth because we still have a little bit of guilt from a sin we've done years ago or a sin we've done whatever. And see, he wants to wipe that sin clean because he doesn't want anything to come between you and him. We grieve him when we don't believe he can redeem us. We grieve him when we don't believe he's as good as he says he is. We grieve him when we don't want to come to him with those inner hurts. We grieve him when we begin to allow that fear to allow pride to step up in us. And now we begin to fulfill our lives with other things because we think we're better because we've now deceived ourselves of walking in pride. That's when we grieve him. We don't want to grieve him. I don't want to think I've arrived. I want everything God has for me. To the end of my days, until I go home to be with the Lord, there's still another realm of glory I want to go to. There's still another realm of God I want to know. There's still more of him. And you know that in eternity, we will spend eternity with him and never really truly know everything there is of God. Again, he created eternity. Let me just mind blow your mind with this. What was before eternity? Think about that. What did he do before eternity? How long has God existed? How long will eternity go on? When did you create time? Well, when will time stop? Does time stop in eternity? All these things happen. Think about that. That's the, that's the immense majesty of our God. So we don't want anything to hold us back from him. So, and we have this personal relationship with him. So just as you would, would you read that again? I don't, glasses there. Does the scripture mean nothing to you that says the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover who intensely desires to have more and more of us? He intensely desires to have more and more of us. I can't, I can, we can't give you any better news. I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get up in the morning, I'm not exactly the most prettiest person. The beard looks crazy, the hair's all over the place, right? Somebody, I mean, anybody know what I'm talking about? Ladies, before you get up and you get makeup on, you know what I'm talking about? And you're like, the hair's not done, the hair's wild, you still got this part over here and that part over here. As guys, we just kind of have whatever. <laughs> There's a little bald spot right back here that keeps growing on me. So what happens is we, we understand that even in the midst of our, our frailty as, 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 as humans, what happens is he still wants to have more and more of us. So because of that... He wants to have us. And we say, well, I've not fulfilled my call. I've not done this. I've not done that. Stop it. As long as you're in the land of the living, there's hope. He who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. He's the faithful one. Let's hold on to him. Because when we do, we grab a hold of truth. When we do, we grab a hold of righteousness. When we do, we free ourselves from the guilt because of the blood that covers us. And we're able to walk into the purposes and plans of God and be able to see everything he wants done for us us amen? amen that's what he wants for us because he's a, he's a jealous lover he wants more and more of you last week we we prayed for everyone and i gonna tell you see he wants so much of you that, that you literally are like I, I don't know i mean you could almost be like you know the the the, the person that's kind of like yeah, just have a little bit of space he's like no i want it all <laughs> right why because he wants it all it's not weird. It's literally, he wants everything. When we got married, I wanted everything of Becky. So I wanted my time with her. I wanted my days with her. I wanted my nights with her. I wanted our kids with her. I mean, I, I, I wanted my life with her. Not because I was weird, but because I made covenant. <laughs> I wasn't doing it from a football field away at a camera. <laughs> right? What happened? I made covenant. And because I made covenant, I was entitled to certain things. Well, I made covenant with the Lord, so he's entitled to certain things. And guess what? I am too. You are too. And because of that, that means you're entitled to the very promises he's made for you. I'm entitled to the very promises he's made for me all through his word. And we can stand on this and trust him that he's as good as he says he is. 
I really want us to get across, we, we, we prayed about this, that we want, you to get, we want you to understand and realize how real Holy Spirit is and how much He is the third person of the Godhead. And yet that very third person of the Godhead is so big, so massive, so just enormous that He wants to have an individual relationship with each one of us, specifically with us. No one else, just with you. He wants to have that relationship with you, and he's just as real as the very air that we're breathing. I'm not saying this is Bible. I'm simply saying this is something I've thought about. This is, my, this is in my time of thought. So the Spirit of God was poured out. God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep, right? The Spirit of God's never left, right? Holy Spirit means, Spirit means vapor, right? What do we breathe in? Again, I'm not saying this is Bible. I'm just simply saying it makes me think. So we're breathing in very air. And that song, This Is the Air I Breathe, I'm kind of like, wow, man, what if it, what if the Holy Spirit, I mean, because if he would take his Holy Spirit from us, we wouldn't, we wouldn't make it. Do you realize how dependent we are on him? Even in, I mean, some of us went through knucklehead days. If anybody understands what I'm talking about, there were knucklehead days we went through. And in those knucklehead days we went through, if he would have took his spirit from this earth, we would have been done. We could have been dust a long time ago, but praise God for his mercy. So when we understand this, we begin to realize there's stuff that God has for you and I. There's things that he wants us to do, and he wants us to be prepared to have that. But he wants us to engage with him by his spirit. I don't pray to Holy Spirit. I invite Holy Spirit. I pray to Jesus. Because Jesus, Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. Jesus reveals the Father. They, they reveal each other. They, they, they're so in unity that it's amazing to think of the Trinity. But they, they so love each other and they so love you. They, they, they love us. They love me. They love you. They love Becky. They love, they love all of us. That the Holy Spirit came to live with us so that we would be able to be reconciled to the Father, and he gave himself as the guaranteed purchase price of the redemption of God. Think about that. So he gave himself so that you and I could have redemption. Amen? Amen. Let's go and stand our feet. Father. Lord, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for everything that you're doing here. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would move upon us with such tremendous, tremendous understanding. I pray that you would make yourself more real to us than we even realize. For those watching by way of live stream, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would begin to experience the reality of Holy Spirit in your home, in your life, that he loves you so much that he gave him, that Jesus died on the cross, gave himself for you so that we could have the helper, Holy Spirit. I pray that the reality of God comes into you and that you hunger and thirst for him more than you ever have before. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, you're in here. I pray that you hunger and thirst more than you ever have before. Vicky's word was so right. He's going to step in and begin to deal with those dark places. He's going to step in and begin to deal with those places that we don't want him to touch because that guilt gives the enemy victory. He wants to get rid of those things that hold us back from him because he wants us to know how much, how much he truly loves us. He wants us to receive the full promise of redemption. In pastoral staff meetings, we say it all the time, the goal is redemption. What does that mean? That means you can be a knucklehead in here. Goal is redemption. We've been it ourselves. Don't let anyone deceive you and think they've already arrived. If they've already arrived, they should have left. But Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. There's dark places. There's dark places that we've held on to, Father. Lord, I ask you just to begin to move in us right now. I ask you to begin to remove those things in us right now. Expose them. We expose them to the light. In Jesus' name, just do this with me. I'm not trying to hold on time. I'm just, do this with me. Say, Jesus, Jesus I, give I give you those dark places. Jesus, Jesus I, give that I give you that guilt. I give it all to you. 
I don't want it anymore. I give it to you. He doesn't want you to walk in that guilt anymore. That guilt may not even been your fault. He doesn't want you to walk in that guilt anymore. Father, I thank you right now for righteousness and redemption. I pray healing upon you right now in the name of Jesus. Healing upon you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I'm just going to linger for just a minute here. You're here and you've been holding on to that. The Lord doesn't want you to hold on to it. You're here and you've been dealing with the disappointment. You try to hide it. You try to put on the good face. The Lord doesn't want you to deal with that no more. Don't hide it. Let's be honest with him. He'll be honest with you. He's a loving God. He's not here to hurt you. He's here to love you. Thank you, Father. All that hurt and all that pain. All that guilt and all that shame right now in the name of Jesus. We release it right now. All the visual memories that you have. Right now in the name of Jesus. We just plead the blood over you right now. I went through a time in my life where I was really struggling because I, before I got saved, I was pretty promiscuous. I'd done a lot of things bad. And I remember I had certain memories of certain times, certain things that happened and certain lies that were told and different things that took place. And I would go back and I would like have these memories, these vivid memories of these things. And I would see them like, a, like they were a, a TV screen. I would see them in my mind. And I, one day I was praying. I said, Lord, I don't know how to get rid of this. And I'll never forget, Holy Spirit just said so, so, so softly, he said, just plead the blood. And I began to plead the blood. And as I pleaded the blood over my memories, it literally was like, as I saw these pictures, I saw blood coming over these memories. And they just washed them clean. I can remember them now without the sting of guilt. I can remember them now without the pain because I realized that was what he redeemed me from. It's not who I am now. So that, that's what he redeemed me from. I'm not that same person. I'm a new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And, and so I'm new. So right now I just plead the blood over your memories. Right now. For any trauma, any rejection, any isolation, any betrayal, any, th any time where you have literally compromised your own statutes or beliefs, right now in the name of Jesus, I just plead the blood over you right now. You receive the healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. We love you. If you need prayer for anything, please go ahead and come on forward. If not, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in with us. I pray that this message today has encouraged you. I pray that it's challenged you, uplifted you. I pray that you came away from this message and this encounter with God, knowing that you have literally stepped into a place where you have heard the heartbeat of God and through everything. Now, in this time, I want to talk to you. Maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ or your relationship is not where it needs to be. Maybe you've walked with God at one point in time and you're no longer walking with him. Or maybe you say that you're a Christian, but deep down inside, you know there's compromise in your heart. If that is you, I want you to go ahead and pray this prayer with me so that what can happen is we can talk to each other again when we see each other, either in the church or in heaven. So let's go ahead and pray. Just repeat after me. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your son's blood. I thank you for the life of Jesus and for his resurrection. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent of them now 
and I ask for you to wipe me clean by your blood. Come into my heart. I receive your salvation, and I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. I walk away from my old life, and I walk into my new life. Thank you, Lord. I am born again. In Jesus' name. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, you are now born again. What I would ask for you to do is I would ask for you to contact the ministry, contact the church, and let us get to you some free material so that you can begin to receive discipleship. See, it's not enough just to pray a prayer. We want you to be discipled. Jesus said, make disciples of all men. So what we want to do is we want to help you in your walk. We want to help you to where you're being able to be discipled and you're being able to walk with Jesus on a daily basis. So thank you so much. God bless you.